Before we start the show, I'd like to ask you, our listeners, to spend seven minutes of your time to fill up the podcast listener survey. You can find a link to the survey in the show's description, on the podcast, on YouTube, and also on the show's website. It would really help me in getting to know you more, and it would help me develop content that is value-adding. Thank you so much. So the idea of liquidity, and I think it started more in the U.S. than it was, I mean, this is where we're where everything stemmed from really and that, that concept but the idea was okay so we've been able to retain you for the first few years you 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 have ownership but we cannot raise your salaries significantly we cannot continuously give you cash bonuses what if we can take this ESOP and actually making it valuable for you today so what does that mean okay you, you we want you to start seeing ESOP as a tangible cash benefit and something that you can benefit from or that you can actually liquidate when you act when you need it as an employee and this is where employee as a benefit, the kind of that whole that, that whole idea of okay, let's take this ESOP and actually make it tangible, realizable, in a way that's good for the company and that aligns with its own retention and benefits plan. So, so that's what we're doing with companies today. Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 54 of Conversations with Lulu. My guests are Rawan Badur and Zuhair Shama. They are the co-founders of Zest Equity a private markets transactions platform that is empowering startup founders, employees, and investors. What does that mean? It means that employee, everybody who is involved in startups can sell shares in private transactions to investors who are eager to have access to these startups. Since its launch in November 2021, Zest Equity has evolved to provide not only the ability to sell shares, but also to raise funding for these startups. We'll talk more in detail about Zest and we'll learn about employee stock option pools, secondary transactions, syndications, and more. Let's tune in. So welcome, yeah. yes. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. having thanks us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. Excited to be here. Congrats, uh, congrats on, uh, on launching Zest and on uh, surviving together for over a year now as partners, Thank as you. co-founders. Yeah, <laughs> to be fair, we've known each other since the fifth grade, which is about 30 years, yeah, and if, uh, Okay. Uh, uh, ever since. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's been, you know, we've seen each other in our individual environments, have tough times, good times. And so uh, when we started together, it just worked. Yeah. So, so you, you can, you defy the myth, basically. You can work with friends. You can. You can. Yeah. I don't know, for me, it's that trust element, never having to think twice about what I say to him or kind of, you know, it, it just, we, we trust each other so much. We know we both have the same intentions and the same motivations and we're, we're heading the same direction. It just, it gives a level of comfort, Saraha. Okay. And as long as you're comfortable in confrontation, in healthy confrontation, I think it'll work because if you shy away from confrontation, then exactly, then yeah, along the way you'll get into trouble. But as long as you know how to confront each other, yeah. you're honest, you're true, you trust each other. So for me, at least, it brings a big level of comfort. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. both we're both very aligned, right? What's best for the company wins. So whenever we have a yeah. sort of debate, at least we both trust. We know it's 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 the interest of Zest at heart and that we're fighting for it because we believe it so much, right? And then, you know, we take a cool down period and then we go back and, you know, sort of the, the decision that's made, ultimately, if one of us disagrees, we know that it's best for Zest, you know? But you, you get to a point where, have you divided uh, tasks basically where some, one of you has the final say on something or you yeah. just share everything so i don't think we didn't start out that way because we were still navigating where are really our strengths because we're similar in a lot of ways but different and it took us a while to understand really where our value is but now i mean things like product for example i will tell zoo you please take the final say because i trust your final judgment for example on on specific things and i think we're we're we were kind of naturally divided mm. um yeah. these things between us. I call Rawan the gatekeeper when it comes to the, you know, the very serious kind of legal stuff that needs to be executed because it's day in, day out. That's what we do. Or decisions that require um, a, a release of cash, for example, right? So I call her the gatekeeper because, you yeah. know, I trust her blindly with that as well. So, so that's, that's, we all laugh in the team. It's like, oh. Uh, hey, come on, I want. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you want something. Exactly, yeah. But, but listen, Well, I you mean, did uh, manage a bank, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so you're, you're, you're sticking with that, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I think the way my mind operates, I'm, I'm very, I think very high level. At the same time, I'm detailed. It's like, it's a combined mix of, 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm conservative and careful with decision making. So I think that's playing to my <laughs> to my strengths here. Yeah, but but to be fair, like like Rawan said, we started, we got into each other's brains, and that was basically the first at least six months before we started to realize where each of us are comfortable, kind of taking control. And we still do a lot of things together, mm -hmm. right? But it's starting to be defined a little more. And we really believe that anyone in our position at such an early stage should try the same. I'm not saying it's right, mm -hmm. right? And for us, it's worked, right, overall. And we haven't had a long enough journey for us to tell you that, you know, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, for us, it's working. Uh, and that's the trust yeah. element that keeps us uh, yeah. that keeps this working. Yeah. yeah, I think it works. Uh, it's I think as look, everything is going to a lot of the decisions and the discussions are going to be done together and together with your team as well. That's how nice. it is in the early days. But I think as long as like there is a final say by somebody on something where really like there's no yeah. agreement or something so that it doesn't, uh, you know, get, you're not in like a stalemate and then, yeah, yeah. And then no, no, nothing no. moves. Yeah. You, you uh, can't right, afford being in a stalemate. No, you can't. No. You yeah. have to be moving no. so fast. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, we, we try our best. And like now, I sometimes I usually know what Tahir is going to say before I even ask the question. So sometimes on our morning huddles, I'm like Tahir, I know your answer on this, but let's just, let's all talk it out for two minutes so that we're all on the same page, for example. And yeah. Then, like we, we, we already, I mean, we know each other really well. And the team now knows us really well and they know who to approach for what. And it just, just Alhamdulillah, it's yeah. been it's been nice and healthy, and it reflects well on the team. We have such a nice, transparent uh, but, uh, to, uh, relationship. Just to add to your point, like we when we started, because of our backgrounds and because of what we did for ten years before we started, actually we had a lot of decision fatigue, mm -hmm. right? And it could be as simple as is there a full stop at the end of the uh -huh. sentence on the platform, uh -huh. right? And we'd <laughs> ponder and think, <laughs> and true, you know, yeah. and and today it's it's completely different, right? Yeah. And it's actually the nature of the beast that that has trained us yeah. uh, to do this and I hope we continue to make yeah, faster right. and faster and faster decisions to be able to deliver what we want to deliver okay so in your own words uh, what what is this solving for what is that problem that you're solving for so so effectively um, and I, I want to tell this through a story right um, it, what we started out as or what the original premise was of Zest in November 2021, uh, or when we discussed it in the summer of 21, was to build a marketplace for secondaries in venture-backed companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please, please define uh, yeah. secondaries. For secondaries. Our I mean, think of it this way: um, it's it's an it's an existing share in the company to be able to buy and sell that. And the idea is why. Um, we are in uh, uh, an ecosystem that's still relatively young and is starting to mature and effectively in the early stage of startups, people you know, invest in the startup. Mm. They believe in your idea. They could be angels, they could be institutions and otherwise. And that's new money into the company mm. and the new money issues a new, technically a new share. It depends what stage you are, but it, it'll eventually become a share. Mm -hmm. That's a newly issued, newly minted share, right? That is called primary. When you think about secondary is, okay, so then if you sell this share, it's being sold, that existing share, that is a secondary transaction, right? Or if you buy an existing share, that is a secondary transaction. And so uh, for and, me... And yeah. this existing share is held by, could be a founder, an employee of a company, Correct. or an investor in the company. Correct. There's a lot of details that go into that and what type of share that is. You have common shares, you have preferred shares, uh, you have employees that hold options to buy a share, and we can dig into that later. But mm -hmm. effectively, yes, stakeholders hold this share. Right. Okay. And so I uh, uh, have been, you know, experimenting with angel investing since I think around 2016. Right. Not a huge angel investor. I wouldn't compare myself with any, you know, large or, or famous angel investor. But I was in a situation in 2021 where I was running a fund and we were winding that down. And I was thinking about my next steps and I wanted to buy time. Uh, and to buy time, I needed some liquidity. And uh, to get that liquidity, I thought I may as well try and sell some of the shares I have uh, 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 in, in some of the, uh, you know, the venture companies that I personally invested in. And, you know, I wouldn't have invested very large amounts. And therefore, the value may have been good to me. I may have made a Forex or whatever it is. 
but it's it's too it was very complicated for the startup and for me to merit a transaction for a, a small amount right to fifty thousand dollars or or so right and so I was like Rowan there's you know that's when we started talking that there's there's an issue right and we were in 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 natural conversation out as friends one day. And that, that's where it sort of clicked that we need to be able to enable that because in the West, you do have markets to enable that. So the original idea of Zest is secondary marketplace to connect buyers and sellers and empower them to transact in a best practice manner that is company sponsored, right? And, um, and what happened is the idea evolved to what it is today, which is a platform infrastructure that gives you the tools to transact. Okay, and you can use it for what you need, right? So we have, um, we have uh, uh, founders uh, running, using our tools to run their fundraise, inviting their own investors mm -hmm. in private, and we're providing the digital uh, tools for them to run this transaction, for example, like uh, the ability to invite the investor and, 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 and to track their progress and also for the investor to be able to see what the opportunity is all about, their own investors, right? And uh, for, for the investor to basically go through a digital process that would otherwise be quote unquote offline, right? So you could submit your interest, you could uh, sign documentation, and then you could fund the transaction and it's all kind of integrated within this platform. And there's many use cases to this, right? And it's all about allowing for um, many investors to be grouped together, right? Which helps at the early stage when you have many angel investors. Yeah, and I think that this is kind of that transition where we realized there was a huge gap on the infrastructure side when you talk about legal infrastructure. Today, I mean, a lot of founders would feel like I cannot go out and raise from the people I want to raise because I cannot afford to have $50,000 tickets and then 20 people on my cap table in the future. Or if or for example, a fund saying my minimum ticket size is X, but I really want X, Y, Z in, and there's no way for me to get them in to my fund given these limitations. So wh while we built this, we realized that that legal infrastructure, that ability to group investors into, into neutral, what we call them neutral passive entities that maintain good governance um, and, and, and just allow for this to happen has, has is adding a lot of value. Founders are coming to us and are saying, I don't feel this pressure anymore. Mm -hmm. I can go out, I can raise my family and friends syndicate, or, or, or I can raise a small portion from my family and friends. I can go to strategic angels that don't want to put more than 25 or 50K, or co-founders from the region who want to actually invest in my startup. But now I don't feel that same pressure of having to sign 15, 20, 25 documents. I can run this through um, that infrastructure layer, Zest, and, and we help kind of from automation all the way to maintaining these vehicles for the lifetime. So we realized this is extremely valuable first for founders and then evolved into actually this is also valuable for VCs um, where sometimes a co-invest vehicle, for example, would take months to set up, would be extremely expensive. And it's not kind of the core in, in the core operations of your fund. So why don't you leverage a platform that mm -hmm. can that can allow you to do this in a much easier and more automated way. And so okay. we started doing this for VCs, uh, for founders, and, mm -hmm. and the use cases just continued to expand and we work with syndicate leads. We work with, I mean, any, any ecosystem player that needs infrastructure to leverage or empower uh, his or her transaction, we're now able to, uh, yeah. to, to assist. Okay. So, so I, I, want us, I want us to, sorry, I want us to clarify because we, we spoke a lot of like technical terms. So right. I yeah. want to clarify a little bit, <laughs> just for those who are not in startups, who are interested in startups or interested in the space. So you wouldn't want a lot of investors on your cap table. So the cap table is basically a record of where all of the shareholders in the company, uh, all of their names and all of their shareholding is recorded. Right. And you don't want to have a lot of people as an entrepreneur. You don't want to have 20, 30 people as investors because it's just administrative, administratively very hard to manage. Uh, and exactly. costly and in costly. the long term. Right? Okay. Yeah. Why is it costly? So, I mean, we, we, we went into detail with this with our, with our lawyers. Right. And the idea is um, with every round that you do. Right. For example, um, but usually, sorry, as we have, yeah. usually these guys, they come in the, in the beginning because later on, if your company is successful, you will probably go to a venture capital fund. Correct. And who will give you that million or two million yes, or whatever. Yes, correct. But these 17, 20, 38, we've seen 100 people stay on your 100. cap table. Yeah, we've <laughs> wow. seen, right? Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that for every one of those, you need to onboard them uh, into your hold code, do the KYC, right? Yes. 
and also the legal docs need to go out to them. They need to sign. So I'm not saying costly just in a sense of, of, of value, but mm -hmm. time, time yes. of the founder to chase these hundred founders down to sign. These hundred investors. Yeah, hundred, hundred investors yes. to, to sign. And, and I've heard cases where the founder would go out to an event that they know this investor is in yeah. with the agreement for them to sign. I've heard cases where the investor's on holiday and, yeah. and uh, you know, is held up, right? I've, had a case. Is held up. Yeah. I've had a case actually yeah. where actually yeah. I lost touch. Like they were, they were, uh, did a crowd equity uh, fundraising, right. uh, crowdfunding uh, in the early days of Nabish. And there were a couple of people who had literally put in a few hundred dollars who have like left the country and I couldn't, couldn't uh, actually yeah. reach them. And there you have it. Uh, yeah. And that can be highly problematic yeah. actually. And, and, and listen, the idea is these investors bring a lot of value to you. Actually our most valuable investors are the angel investors. They're opening yeah. doors, needless to say the institutions as well, but, and, and we love them. Um, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's over time, you need to have an efficient system that ensures that these angel investors get their benefit, economic mm -hmm. upside, but at the same time, the company is nimble enough to be able to execute quickly. Yeah. yeah. So there's another thing also that you mentioned. Uh, th there's a lot of terms, so I'm trying to, re to, to sure, reverse yeah. back a little bit. So, <laughs> so as a founder, you don't want to have 20, 30, 50 people on your uh, cap table. You would want them grouped in a specific entity that you can build on Zest, and that entity will end up investing in your company. And this can be called a syndicate, right? So you also spoke about syndication. So syndication is when you bring in a group of investors exactly. to you know, form like a legal entity, a Correct. special purpose vehicle that invests in your company. What else did we say on track? I'll rem if I remember, we'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll, 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 we'll clarify. VC co-invest co vehicles yeah. yes. as well. So VC co-invest vehicles is? Yeah, so if basically when a VC, for example, a VC has a fund, yes. right? That fund has LPs, okay? Limited and a, partners. Limited so partners. <laughs> Which are correct, investors. Yeah. Which are <laughs> investors who, yes, exactly. <laughs> and these limited, uh, th this VC would have invested into a company at its early stage. And I'm um, just thinking how many technical terms we're going to jump through to get this <laughs> there. And, and in, in, in that next round of this company that that VC has invested in, that VC, the, the VC would have an allocation, likely have an allocation to invest, mm -hmm. right? And um, that allocation uh, uh, may be um, uh, too large for the VC to want to allocate all of its funds from the fund uh, to uh, uh, to that specific company because VCs also have you know rules about concentration or maybe the VC just does not want to deploy that much into that opportunity um, how uh, um, because it has a lot of other opportunities that it needs to hit but it wants to share the upside it believes in the company and so the VC has the option to create a side vehicle mm -hmm. for its existing investors or others to invest in uh, alongside, on, alongside them. them to basically say maybe the fund invests a million but the co-invest can invest two million and so overall the VC has exposure to three million and it could benefit from the upside in the long term and effectively what it does is gives its existing limited partners the option to invest in this co-invest vehicle. Okay, and so Great. that yeah, that I hope I hope that's clear. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's very clear. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about the the size of that opportunity, right? For you as a, I mean, for you, you left your, you both left your jobs, right? right. You have families, correct? You have kids, right? You have to pay bills. Yeah. Uh, so so you obviously believe the opportunity is is big enough. Yeah. So I looked at, I just refreshed myself. I looked at the amount of investment that went into startups in the region last year, according to WAMDA, it's close to uh, $3.9 billion, billion right. dollars, yeah. uh, across 800 deals. So this 3.9 billion is probably gonna create a lot of value, right? So ho hopefully these companies would be worth, I don't know, double or more or- Correct, yeah. Not sure, actually. Correct, yeah. So what what is the opportunity size for, for you, for, for Zest, as you see it? Sure, and, and, and by the way, given the, the, the lack of transparency, and I know people are solving for that, um, it's, it's uh, the, the, 
the information that we have is in MENA, Pakistan and Turkey currently, right? And so let's take your example. That was a MENA number, by the way, I gave That you. was a MENA number, That was a MENA right. number, according to WAMDA. Yeah, so, so for us, what we say for MENA, Pakistan and Turkey, only on transactions, because we, need, we, you know, we think we need to go into SaaS products to help people transact, etc. But in terms of transactional tra total addressable market for us, um, we see that going to about 15 billion in five years' time. Okay, and this is only in MENA, Pakistan, and Turkey. We uh, are looking at ourselves as an emerging markets play, right? We 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 want to go east, right? E even more, we want to tackle other markets. But today, we're seeing this as a as a total addressable market for us in five years' time of about fifteen billion. Mm -hmm. And and just think about it. How do you how do you get there, right? There's a lot of sort of nuances in our product, etc. But the the the, the reality is, to your number, in MENA, last year, about 4 billion primary transactions, okay? 4 billion in tra primary transactions does not, n does not translate into... Uh, uh, you need to convert that into enterprise value, mm -hmm. which is the valuation of these companies, yes. right? <clears throat> and so if you assume a 20% dilution on average, mm -hmm. okay, then you multiply that number by 5. So then MENA becomes 20 billion enterprise value created in that year, mm -hmm. okay? And it's a bit complicated because then you have the years before, what was the enterprise value created then, and that, does that add on to that? But let's just focus on this one year. And so you think about 20 billion, and then you say, how much of those are primary transactions that we could uh, tackle? How much of those are secondary transactions that we could track tackle uh, using our infrastructure? And so that's effectively the number in mm. MENA PT, that 15 billion in, in, in okay. five years' time. But I want yeah. some of these companies would probably fail. I mean, not uh, not that 4 billion that was invested, it's, they're not all going to succeed. So do you, do you still think the opportunity is, like, what do you think is the opportunity in uh, four secondaries from that, let's say, 17 or 20 billion? Listen, th I mean, the methodology we we put in place was we looked at the US 10 years ago, right? And, and looked at what the market looked like there and then. And in terms of taking the growth rates and, and, and putting the discounts or the haircuts that we call on, on that top line enterprise value to, to come up with what is the actual addressable market for us, we're quite heavy and, 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 and comparable to the US 10 years ago. And I mean, it, 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 it all depends on how positive you are on the ecosystem overall, right? Whether in MENA or in emerging mm -hmm. markets, you have to believe that this, this this will continue to grow, that we'll have more innovation coming coming to the region. And it's starting, right? Yeah. You have more talent here. You have a lot more capital. You have a lot of foreign US-based investors or even companies that are coming and basing themselves here in the region. And so you have to believe in that upside. We think our approach is quite conservative and it's just based on status quo today and slow growth. Um, and, and I think, so I think I hope, and I actually really do believe that even our numbers are probably way undervalued. And I think the larger opportunity for us, which we did not, I mean, which is something we didn't think about a year ago, but the larger opportunity for us is going to come on the SaaS side. What we're building today and what we're realizing, there's so much value in the tools and there's so, so many new markets and, and new revenue sources that we can enter into as we grow and as we develop by providing these SaaS, um, SaaS and kind of tech tools to, to companies to be able to use this and benefit from it in their own mini ecosystems. So whether you're talking about investment banks in the future, smaller boutique investment banks, smaller boutique family offices, there's a lot that we're building. So these are the syndication products that we spoke about before. Exactly. That's what you mean by the SaaS uh, product? A, a lot of that, it can even go into kind of employee-based SaaS products, um, tools for founders that allow them to kind of manage their own liquidity programs. And I know we're going to go into okay. this later, but yeah. there's a lot you can do on the SaaS side, which, which takes you from that transactional let's say, um, play to, to something a lot larger and a lot bigger, and we see a lot of value there. And that's why today we call ourselves infrastructure, because okay. we realized with infrastructure, you empower people to do what they were going to do anyway in a very inefficient way, yeah. but you're empowering people to, to, to do things in, um, in, in kind of a new, innovative way, and we think there's a lot of value there. Okay. I think that's where we're going to grow. To take your attention back to, to, to sort of transactions, and the numbers that we had discussed are venture. But in reality, the, yes. the, what we've done and the tools that we've built apply to private markets, yes. right? So there is an avenue. I mean, we picked venture out of a need, but there is an avenue to go into different sub-asset classes uh, that, that we could also tackle that would further expand the market. Uh, but for now, we're happy where we are. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk, I mean, because Rawan mentioned inefficiencies. So 
how is the secondaries market? I mean, how are secondary transactions uh, done today? How? So you said basically, if if you're a small investor, pretty much you're doomed because no one's gonna sell shares for like fifty thousand so. dollars. It's 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 th it's not that you're doomed. It's just it's it's such. There's a lot of hurdles you have to jump. Yes. And uh, and and those hurdles can include uh, first is is uh, let's say you're a seller and you have a buyer right and the buyer is willing to buy the 50, so I'm an employee 000. in the company yeah I have hundred shares I want to sell yeah whatever fifty because I want to yeah whatever get let's married. say these f shares are worth fifty thousand okay yes. and your cousin wants to buy them mm -hmm. okay because they believe in you yeah. and they believe in <laughs> and so so how do you go about doing that uh, without the infrastructure or so you, you actually first you have a, uh, a, a, a you have to go to you know your line manager or at least the founder and say this is what I want to do mm -hmm. and and that takes courage so that's step one right and then step two um, your founder basically um, uh, is now thinking that I'm a X hundred million dollar company or, or I don't know fifty million dollar in valuation and there's this fifty thousand stake that wants to be traded. And so now I need to, you know, uh, tell you, OK, fine, but I need to involve the lawyers that cost money. OK, I uh, actually there are some hurdles in your agreement. I need to probably go to the board to get approval and potentially the shareholders, depending on your sh your option share agreement. Right. And how it looks. Uh, and that process takes time and it'll take you maybe a month for us to get the internal clearance first before we get the legal documentation in place. Um, and and then. Um, and, th and then and then you know your buyer needs to understand these documents right and they also need to trust that these are sort of the right documents this is your cousin he'll, he'll trust you it's okay but you know sometimes that's not the case uh, you need to sign the documentation do the wire and then file that on the company level okay and 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 there's other kind of you know in, in as you're going through this process maybe the board doesn't approve as you're going through this process, maybe a shareholder says, no, I want, you know, I want to trigger this or it's too small for me to trigger. It's just and at such as whether it's a fifty thousand dollar transaction or a five million dollar transaction, it's the same sequence. Mm -hmm. OK. And the same costs. And so what we're trying to do is is help the companies bring ten fifty thousand dollar people together. And then that starts to merit a transaction. And at the same time, uh, helping them standardize these processes where the employee it's it's not their headache their founder it's not their headache right it's 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 a process that we've designed and you could do it and you can transact without these and you get all the benefits so that's the sort of idea there mm -hmm. okay. yeah and i think and, and, and i mean no employee or almost no employee will be able to have the capacity or or the transparency in information to understand okay if i've signed this document does this mean from a governance perspective that the shares were actually transferred legally does this mean um, that now that i own them i actually own them or will someone come up a year later and say actually this whole transaction it w w was not authorized in the right way or something that was supposed to be triggered was not triggered and you see that happening I and mean, we've seen real case examples and sometimes even the founders themselves, because you have so many layers of governance and approvals built into the documents over time uh, as a company, unless you're bringing in lawyers and actually really mapping something out, you could get into, into trouble um, where, where transactions that you thought were complete actually get nullified a year later or two years later. So that's part of, I mean, standardization, making it large enough for a founder or a company to actually run this correctly and to get all the right approvals and, and giving and what we're trying to do is turning this from just a need from a single person to, to actually, you know what, company, for you, this is actually very valuable. So today, when, when we call ourselves, we're providing liquidity as a benefit or liquidity as a service. We're coming to you and tell you we're working with XYZ. We have these lawyers in place. We've, we're building in standardization in terms of how secondaries are, are occurring in the region. And, and we make this so easy for you in the sense of, you know what, now I know. I, I, have, I have to solve for something. I have an issue with retention. I have a couple of employees who've been working with me for six years, and I see how much um, they're struggling from, from a cash perspective. Yeah. They cannot pay their bills, et cetera. I mean, and we'll go into the whys later, but, but if you empower the company to be able to, to map out a process that's clear for everyone, that's transparent, that's approved by their board, that yeah. the shareholders understand, you, the secondaries will stop being this kind of black box that, wait, I don't know how to do mm. this and how to process it, and wait, I need to call which lawyer. 
you just kind of normalize it and you 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 build it in um, to the company's uh, yeah as it becomes something that the company know, knows how to do and how to execute you give the company the tools it needs to be able to run a either a company sponsored event or if it's an angel who wants to sell like a company sanctioned event exactly. right and there's a lot of sort of also nuances that we haven't uh, discussed which is for example maybe the company is worried that this employee or this 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 shareholder you know is 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 sharing sensitive information with the buyer mm -hmm. they don't want it you know so so we give we give the company the ability to approve the information that's being shared right um, when to open a liquidity window? Maybe it's not the right time for that your you know um, your cousin to buy your shares because I'm doing a fundraise right now, right? Okay. And you know, so there's there's a lot of things that we're trying okay. to do to align the stakeholders. And I'm not saying we've perfected it, but we're, we're slowly building in these tools over time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a quick break. All right. You know what I love about what you're building? It's the it's the uh, data. Right. Like today, if I want to invest in a company uh, that's successful and it's still private, I don't know what the valuation of this company is. I don't know uh, what are the prospects of that company? Uh, how far can it get? Unless I have some kind of access. Right. Yeah. Uh, either I'm like an angel investor or I know someone who invested or something. I think so. I think this data is, is, uh, is very much needed. Yeah. It, yeah, maybe I'll give a parallel. I mean, we read a lot about like case studies, just generally the U.S. and how it operates. And again, it's a much more mature market. Yeah. But but the more you look into how they operate and how companies started to IPO, you realize how much the second like when when the, when the secondary market opened up, especially after the two thousand eight two thousand nine financial crisis, because I think that's when kind of IPO slowed down and companies were forced to resort to other forms of of liquidity to, to help ease some of the pressure along the way to IPO. But after that phase, they were kind of forced into that secondary space. They started to look for alternative sources of liquidity. And they and slowly, I think the market actually very quickly realized that, that these transactions are giving them a lot more power for that IPO or for that exit. Because as people are engaging with your brand, as people are reading into your data, you're starting to get real market insight about does the valuation you had in mind make sense? Um, how are you being perceived? Are you communicating in the right way? And it becomes kind of a learning curve for both you know, the market, the investors, and then and then these founders and, and, and their kind of the VCs behind them into, into finding that right balance of how do I communicate? What kind of numbers do I need to show? And with time, the second the data that started coming out on the secondary transactions became super valuable for that IPO and, and people were able to gauge price better and, and actually have more successful launches um, in terms of exits. And, and I think this is gonna be extremely important here yeah. as well. And uh, let's, let's, I mean, in terms of data and, you know, saying that we have a pool of data, the reality is we're not there yet, mm. right? We're sort of building that to be able to, you know, in the future say, ah, a, a fintech in this sector at this stage usually trades at X, right? Or, and if you do uh, this sort of discount, it's, you know, either uh, not high enough as a discount for, for it to transact, right? So these are things that we have to collect over time to start to be able to give value for, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it's, it's something that's core to us, you know, uh, to, to think about where this can go. But definitely, you know, uh, in agreement, the data yeah. is a very important piece. Yeah. yeah, in general, in general, we do lack data in, in this part of the world, right? You have... Magnet, which is probably the only uh, platform yeah. or maybe one of the few who are uh, collecting data on startups yeah. and providing this kind of intelligence. So I think any any platform that provides uh, uh, transparency and data is, is very yeah. important for us exactly. as the ecosystem. I, uh, Sorry, but the word that you said, like intelligence, I think it's not just about not giving out this data as companies. The fact it's companies don't really have this data either. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're, when you're doing round by round every 24 months, okay, you have one data point on that specific fundraise, how it went, the, the specific intricacies that, that went on there to set a valuation. But having an active kind of secondary market, this is what really tests these valuation points and, and will give mm. you that intelligence as a company and then reflecting back into the quality of the data that you yeah. have. Because, because also, I think building on that is that if your existing investors are typically very happy, you know, pushing towards a higher valuation because on their books, 
it looks like the company, right, is doing very well. So, okay, they raised at a $10 million valuation. Now they are raising at 50 million. Now they're raising at 100 million. So it's in their best interest as well for these valuations to be inflated. And I think this is what we're suffering uh, from today, right, vis-a-vis -vis, like the valuations of uh, mm. the past couple of years. So to your point, Rawan, what you're trying to say, I guess, is that if, let's say, uh, uh, some of these investors, they want to sell a $5 million stake in the company at a $20 million valuation, for example, and those buyers come and say, well, no, hang on, it's not worth 20, it's worth 15. So this is the this is what you're talking about, right? Exactly. This is the intelligence and the data that, that you're able to kind of gather over time. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and sometimes it's an education gap, right? So sometimes, OK, going going to the market for the first time, giving very limited data, maybe the buyers or the investors coming actually are not fair to say you're not worth 20. Maybe they don't have enough data as well. Yeah. So it's how do you navigate that? So, I mean, let's let's slowly, slowly kind of um, lessen this gap, whether mm -hmm. it's information like just being more transparent in terms of the information that you're giving, have people start to understand these businesses that are growing and that are in the media all the time. And, and that level of kind of just yeah, removing that information asymmetry, I guess, to a certain extent, yes. will will lead to a more fair valuation on both sides. Okay. Um, mm. And it's not an easy job. Uh, and again, it'll take time, right, to get people comfortable in a way. But slowly, slowly, we chip away and, mm. and uh, more and more people are being yeah. open to this. And by the way, this is yeah. in zest or no zest. I mean, right, you, you're seeing this. You're seeing an increase in secondaries in general. You mm. see a lot of it in Saudi. You see a lot of it here. And yeah. it happens within, let's say, maybe a, a, a more of a closed loop it ecosystem. Does. Not everyone has access to it, Not for sure. We need access. to have that access. Because, as you said, because the, 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 the transactions the, that are happening today, they're, they're quite high in value, right? So you have to be either a, like a syndicate or you should do it as a co-invest uh, with a fund or something like that. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give access to everyone. Whereas, for example, like I did a secondary transaction, actually we bought shares uh, in Kraken, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. the, the crypto exchange. And we were able to, I think, group like three or four of us and buy for a few hundred thousand dollars. So. Um, so yeah, I, I guess you, you, you could do it in, in lower values, it doesn't need to be a big transaction, but here can you do it? Can you buy like $100,000 in a company or, or the legal hurdles and the costs of it and the approvals that you highlighted earlier are just, yeah, you know, so it's, so doesn't it's, make sense. That, that's where the, the platform comes in, right? Yeah. To enable you to do transactions that are relatively smaller in a standardized and automated manner uh, that 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 can you know that that would allow you to sort of group ten people at ten thousand dollars for a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, you can do that definitely. Okay. Um, there are some nuances in terms of what percentage uh, that your the fees would constitute from that transaction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a fixed sort of structure. Uh, like for for us to be able to provide you with this infrastructure, we would charge a fixed fee because we have lawyers to pay, et cetera, yeah. to, to help create the structure. Yeah, yeah. So does it make so, sense, basically? So does it make sense? So, so you, uh, given you, the fees, does it make sense to yeah. do a smaller amount? So you have to decide, yeah. 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 You and your your, guy, your your investors, you you have to decide, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're, you know, we're definitely more efficient and uh, cost effective than the alternative offline method. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so let's talk about the, the, the key ingredient in this all, which without it, like none of this would exist, the employee stock option pools, right? So let's f explain it. Sure. I, I mean, this is, I, I think, a big part of why we love what we're doing is, is probably this employee component. Okay. Um, so yes, okay. And you think about you think about early stage startups, you cannot pay the same salaries as a Google or an Apple will. So how companies sold for this I mean, started solving for this is giving ownership, right? Giving stake in the company. So as an employee, you feel like I actually am earning the upside. I feel like I'm an owner, I'm empowered, etc. And And these ESOP, I mean, we're going to call them ESOP, yes. so employee grants, they could be anything from stock options. And stock options are basically the right to buy a stock at certain stages at exits. They can be uh, called RSUs, restricted stock option units. They could be phantom shares. There are many different types of what you would call employee ownership uh, methods, uh, all have benefits uh, depending on the geography you're in, depending on the tax jurisdiction. But essentially what it means is as an employee, I'm getting part cash and then part equity or part uh, shares in, in, in that company that I'm working for. 
And what it should, what it does in theory is it keeps you retained for longer because you know the longer you stay, the more equity you will have in this, and you're participating together with the founders mm -hmm. and with the investors in the upside at exit. But these, uh, these, by the way, these employee stock option pools, the founders uh, uh, have shares from them as well, or the founders have typically, from what you see, like separate shares. Sometimes it's situation yeah. specific, it yeah, and it depends on the stage. But I think the later you get. You know, as a founder, you need to also be incentivized, and so the board will grant you some options. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's typically yeah. for for employees. It's typically for employees, founders. I mean, at the end, when then they convert into shares, they're what we call common shares. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of the lowest in terms of the rights that, that you have. They're they're kind of the most basic equity component of a, of a company, mm -hmm. and employees and founders usually have have similar, let's say, common common shares. Um, but and, and when when ESOP started, generally the rules were or the best practice was okay. You, you come in um, and you get let's say a grant for a hundred thousand dollars. This hundred thousand dollars you don't earn today. You earn over time. Mm -hmm. So let's say. I mean, the standard for a while was four years. Mm -hmm. So over four years, as Has long it as changed? it changed, yes. And really? I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon that a bit. But it hasn't changed. But there are trends seeing it. Uh, becoming a little bit shorter now oh, and people okay. are experimenting with different things but the standard is four years you usually have a one-year cliff cliff meaning if you leave before a year you don't get anything you forfeit your rights to the shares but so you have that one-year cliff and then after that every month or every quarter depending on the company and their rules you you get additional proportions um, of that and then after four years you have that whole allocation for a hundred thousand let's say um, but okay, so you have that 100,000, four years has passed, you love this company, and you know that maybe in six years it will exit, or maybe in four years, or you're in a down market, and maybe the IPO will take a little bit longer, but you know that this company is doing well and you believe, and you don't want to leave. But then a Google comes and says, I can triple your cash salary, uh, forget stock options, um, I, I want you now. Um, and, 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 and for you as an employee, it becomes a very hard decision. I love this company, I wanna stay here, but I also have bills to pay. I haven't been able to buy the house that I wanted because I'm working for a startup. I haven't, I haven't, there's a lot of opportunity it's cost, right? School, my school. kids need to go to school. Yeah. Norm normal yeah. things. Yeah. And it becomes an opportunity cost, right? And you have to think about it and really like from, okay, I need to be fair to my family as well. And this is where you, and especially the last two years, you started seeing retention rates in startups go down significantly because you had global players come into the market and even startups that are very well funded later stage that just started grabbing talent from the, from the younger startups, paying really high cash salaries. And as a startup, what do you do? I mean, you have a certain budget, you have certain cash flows to manage, you can't be paying what an Apple pays an employee. Um, so the idea of liquidity, and I think it started more in the U.S. than it was, I mean, this is where, where everything stemmed from, really, and that, that concept. But the idea was, okay, so we've been able to retain you for the first few years. You, you, you have ownership, but we cannot raise your salaries significantly. We cannot continuously give you cash bonuses. What if we can take this ESOP and actually making it valuable for you today? So what does that mean? Okay, you, you, we want you to start seeing ESOP as a tangible cash benefit and something that you can benefit from or that you can actually liquidate when you, act, when you need it as an employee. And this is where employee as a benefit, kind of that whole, that, that whole idea of, okay, let's take this ESOP and actually make it tangible, realizable in a way that's good for the company and that aligns with its own retention and benefits plan. So, so that's what we're doing with companies today. We're having the discussion of, okay, you have this many employees, this is, this is the, the situation, These are, this is your retention rate, your balance between cash and ESOP, some have 50-50, some have 80-20, whatever it is, we work together with that company to say, okay, it makes sense to provide certain liquidity windows for these employees to be able mm -hmm. to, to get some cash for that ESOP over time. Okay. And when we say cash... So, so basically, the, what you're saying is that the company can take can offer the employee potentially to buy uh, some of their shares, right? So that they can get access to cash? Is that what no, you're saying? Not necessarily yeah. the company. Maybe the, uh, the company someone itself. Else. Someone else, you know, the company has existing investors mm -hmm. that want more exposure. And so we're providing you with the tools exactly. to do that. Because okay. a buyback yeah. means that you have the cash as a company to, to yeah. pay for it. And these. typically startups don't have that. Don't. And, and the yeah. idea is there might be more valuable ways to use your cash, right? So, yeah. so let's help you um, kind of standardize these processes and enabling mm -hmm. these secondary transfers to happen on the employee level so yeah. that you can provide these liquidity windows for, for employees. Um, can, I, can I touch on the why th this has started to happen, mm -hmm. right? And effectively, um, prior to 2008 in the US, right, uh, the life cycle of a startup was shorter. 
right? IPOs used to happen faster. I mean, today you look at the eight to 10 year lifetime. Before then it was much shorter. And then what, what you would see is um, a, a team members or employees that had these ESOP plans or RSUs in place would see the benefit much earlier because mm -hmm. they'd be able to crystallize value. Okay. Through the IPO, through the or exit, the sale or the IPO, or etc. Yeah. And then afterwards, you started to see, for, for you know, uh, for, for for different for many different reasons, that that uh, liquidity window extend, and so that's when you started to see in the U.S. players uh, come and try and solve for this problem um, by providing liquidity, uh, to, allowing and empowering companies to provide liquidity to, yeah. to their employees. It's still novel. It's still new. Right, but you see more and more names starting to do this, and yeah. and and we think there's parallels between the post two thousand and eight um, U.S. and where we are here, where we're still a young market and exits are you know starting to come to fruition, but mm -hmm. not as frequent as you need them, and not as and, and but still in as long a time as you know that eight to ten year period. So how do you keep these team members engaged? Mm -hmm. You know, this is one way. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely look. Uh, equity is one of these things that, uh, like, as a startup founder, usually, um, it's um, it didn't have a lot of value, right? Like when I started Nabish back in two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve, like equity wasn't really valuable when you offer it because. It's a dream. You, it's a dream, <laughs> it's exactly. A dream. And and even till today, right? We have a handful of unicorns across the region. It's not like companies, you know, it's not like we're minting unicorns on a, on a monthly basis or something like that. So it's still a very nascent market. Uh, so equity was this kind of like this illiquid thing that you have, that you have to wait, as we said, seven, ten years so that if there is a sale, you know, you will, you will get. And if... And if the sale is good, right? Because also if the sale true. is not good, then obviously, you, as a common shareholder, you won't you won't get much. Correct. Yeah. Um, but um, but now I think it, it it could be used as a tool because we are seeing a lot of investments going into startups. We are seeing the sector grow. So now today you could say, okay, I'll give you you know uh, whatever hundred shares or or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Small company, percentage and it's valuable. If, if you're and I think options. that giving people the ability to to sell these is uh, is is very important because then they see it, feel it. Exactly. Or it becomes tangible. Oh, actually, I can cash this. And you know, if you cash it and then your company flops later. And we've looked at trends, right? <laughs> like, we've looked at trends. Like, how, how can this be effective? Okay, what you want to avoid and what you definitely don't want to do is, is it, doesn't ha it, it doesn't feel like a payout, like an exit, right, for employees. Yeah. It's actually controlled in small percentages and recurring over time. And, and kind of giving that option, yeah. do you want to or do you not? And, and looking at trends in the US, for example, you see a 10%, for example, for executives leaving, uh, for executives. So let's say you're, you're designing what do you mean? a program. What do you mean? Okay. So you're designing a program for employees and you want to set what criteria. So how much are they able to actually sell in this window? What percentage okay. of their vested ESOP? So what we've seen, for example, for executives, the limits are generally maximum up to 10% of your vested. Okay. Um, for non-executives, it co could go a bit higher, maybe 15, 25. And again, this is these are U.S. parallels. Okay. And then for maybe former employees, early angels, it's a lot more flexible and at our discretion. But but the idea here is we're talking about controlled, uh, small portions of liquidity. So I don't go and just sell all my shares. Yeah. And, yeah. You limit bad actors exactly. or yeah. any of the sort. Yeah. And you believe in the upside of the company, right? You don't want to sell at today everything at today's valuation. Mm. But right now you have some cash needs. So you you, you opt in for a, a small portion. And then over time, as yeah. there are liquidity windows, you can, you can keep, hopefully, I mean, uh, benefiting from that upside every year by selling bits and pieces along the way. Yeah. It so, so how are companies doing? I mean, what what are you seeing now in the region when you go and talk to startups? Uh, are they are they open to the idea of this? Are the founders mm. open? The investors? It, when we started this, it was very fresh, very new. We got the I really like this, but then there was no action. Mm -hmm. Okay. Today, we're seeing more and more inbounds of people who want to do this, right? Because I think they start to see the value. Of, 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 of what this can mean for their team and for their long-term growth. So generally, we see that it's being accepted and we're getting inbounds for people to want to do this, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still new, it's still fresh. We still have to explain it. We still have to give everyone the comfort that you know it's not a Wild West market where the employee can dump all their shares. Like It's very controlled in a way, and uh, we still have a very long way to go. 
but we're starting to see acceptance. Yeah. And I think acceptance. the macroeconomics here, right? This, this is usually the trigger for any sort of change in a culture or in behavior. And when you look at macroeconomics today, I mean, the situation here is, is sh I mean, oh. relatively better than the West or mm -hmm. than, than developed economies. But you still do have, I mean, fundraising is down and looking at the latest reports from the one the I mean, you have fundraising is relatively down. Companies are a lot more conservative with their cash. Uh, you see a lot of layoffs happening. And I mean, this is part of the natural cycle, right? When you're when, when you're in this situation. And then on the flip side, inflation is up. Expenses, everyday expenses are, are, are just increasing significantly mm -hmm. every day. And salaries will not catch up. So today you actually have a real need for liquidity. Like employees are not saying, oh, please give me a payout so I can go spend it on vacation. Like mm -hmm. Employees actually need the cash to be able to survive the day-to-day -day pressures. And if you want to keep employees and founders too engaged and focused on the right exit, on the right growth path, and not feel like, okay, I, I need I need to kind of find whatever I can and just exit because we need liquidity. It, it, it's a way of thinking about like incentivizing people in, a, in, in another way. Yes, yeah. I am looking for that upside, but at the same time, if you relieve some of these pressures and I'm more content in my day to day, I will actually look for long-term value and long-term growth in this company. And this is, I think, the psychology um, that that's starting to, uh, to, to that we're starting to see here. Yeah. Are there are, are there any other like cultural barriers that you're seeing to this? Like, uh, I don't know, are investors comfortable with this or? Uh anything else that's coming up as you have these conversations? It's funny, you see both extremes, right? And really, when you say extremes, both extremes. Some investors embrace this completely and understand it. Some say, well, no, let's, let's, let's just keep going to the exit and we all find liquidity. You, you see opposing views. Okay. And I think, I mean, you'll always see these opposing views, but there's definitely a lot more openness and acceptance than there was a year and a half ago, at least when we started these conversations. Uh, we definitely do see the difference. And Saudi in particular, this is where, I mean, we, we feel like there's a lot of excitement around this space. Um, and especially, I mean, now, I mean, they have a whole mandate for, for IPOs and, and whatnot. So you have the VCs actually starting to talk about these, these things, secondaries mm. and employee secondaries. Uh, so you see a lot of this activity here as well. Um, yeah, I think so long as it's understood how the process is done and it's mm -hmm. not, again, a Wild West employee can go dump all their shares mm -hmm. and resign and move or et cetera, et cetera. Like there is a purpose of, 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 and, and a bit of education that we need to get to, yeah. uh, to, to show what it is that we're trying to, to achieve yeah. with employee liquidity. I mean, I think the worry would be on the investor side, maybe not the employees because the employees don't really hold, I mean, usually the, the, the ESOP pool is what, 10%, maybe 15. Yeah. If you're very Probably. generous, 20, yeah, yeah. maximum. Yeah. It's the founders though, right? It's the founders uh, like who I guess the investors would be worried about or, uh, or, um, or another investor in the company that might want to sell their shares, for example, to someone that you don't want in the company. Maybe. Sure, sure. So, so what happens? Yeah. There is there, there are rights, right? For so, this? so so definitely. Um, I mean, we can talk about it from a legal perspective, and then how we sort of implement it to our place, but uh, on our platform. But the reality is, uh, if you're an employee and you want to sell, um, uh, you have to get. Uh, Predominantly, for the most part, what we are seeing is it's a board matter, right? So basically, even you have if to you're go, an employee, if you're an employee, you have to yes, because no liquidity clauses are really built into ESOP, and we're encouraging companies moving forward to say that you know you're allowed to subject to X Y Z approval, right? So okay. so so um, predominantly, what we're seeing and in best practice matter, it's 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 a board reserved matter or a remuneration committee. Matter. So you have to get that sort of approved, okay? And whoever sits on that board usually is, you know, the founder and some of the larger investors. So they have to approve it, okay? So there's that first control mechanism, okay? Um, and so if the investor is unhappy or they don't want, you know, this mm. to go, they, they, can, they can just choose not to approve it. But the reality is it's such a small stake for the employee that it's actually more beneficial to allow it to happen uh, and, uh, you know, and also the companies in control on the investor side, like who gets to come in, right? They can set the parameters. Now, where it gets a bit more, another level of, of hurdles is when it's um, an existing, you know, shareholder, a stakeholder, an early angel or another mm -hmm. investor who wants to sell a chunk of their, uh, yeah, uh, a big their holding, chunk. a big chunk, yeah. okay? 
And in that uh, process is predominantly governed by what is called a shareholders agreement, which is a long agreement mm -hmm. that dictates the relationship between the shareholders, et cetera, um, and the company. And in there, a lot of the times, and we're, you know, uh, we're starting to see this change, but there is something called a right of first refusal. Okay, or a right of first offer. That clause prevents that, and I'll explain it in a second, prevents me as an investor to just go and sell to Rawan or to you mm -hmm. without going back to the, uh, a list of shareholders first, offering my shares to them. Mm -hmm. okay? And they can, you know, um, they can offer to buy them, okay? or, um, and then you, know, you go through this whatever it is, five day, one week, one month period, mm -hmm. we've seen variances, before you get that clearance to go and sell it into the mm -hmm. open market, okay? And so that is our... So, so basically yeah. it needs to be offered to the existing shareholders first. Yes. If they approve it, uh, great, then you can sell. If they don't approve it, then they have to make an offer to buy it of you. It basically, it's, it's give me an offer or we cross the, the period, yeah. right? The, the, this yeah. ROFR period or yeah. ROFO period. And, but what we also see in more mature markets and what a lot of legal firms here are trying to push is the, you know, having no ROFR or ROFO, but to right have some to... controls in place that are easier than a ROFR or a ROFR, because if you want to trigger either and you have a hundred investors on your cap table, you know, it's, and, and someone says, maybe I want to buy and that yes. kind of holds your process and then they don't end up buying and you lose your buyer. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to make it easier. Okay. But still those those processes are in place and you yeah. see them a lot. Ron, briefly, as we, as we wrap, why do we need, uh, I mean, there are similar solutions out there in the world. You guys decided to work on a local solution. What do you, what do you feel are the benefits of, of us working with the people locally here? Listen, I, I, think, I think localization for us means kind of trust and, and building a and integrating with an ecosystem that already works very well together and that's very closely knit. So when you localize, build trust and provide tools um, that aligns the interests of different stakeholders, I think this is where the value is. Because you have a lot of platforms, but generally if you look at the US, it's a lot more open. The word, okay, they use the word company sponsored, but technically shareholders are a lot more free to go and set prices and sell. And you have a lot more movement kind of on the secondary. What we're trying to do here is is empower these transactions in a way that's beneficial for all uh, because we are a nascent market because we feel like if a VC is uh, is benefiting, the employee is benefiting, the investor, the founder, we, there is a way to actually bring everybody together, increase that transparency and put in a model in place that everybody trusts and is comfortable with. And and I feel like if you, tra if you can crack that and really become that partner, that infrastructure provider, you'll add a lot more value um, to the ecosystem holistically. And we're very impact driven as well. I mean, we love our region. We think there's so much untapped kind of talent and potential and we believe in the growth and, and we just want to be kind of on ground level, grow with it um, and, and continue to localize as much as possible. Great. The offering. Well, thank you so much guys for coming. I really enjoyed this converse conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks you for too. having us. Thanks <laughs> good luck. Thank, thank you, you very much, much Lulu. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Conversations with Lulu with Zuhair Shama and Rawan Badur, the co-founders of Zest Equity. If you want to learn more about Zest, you can go to zestequity.com. Don't forget to check out the show's website, conversationswithlulu.com, to look at all the other episodes. You can also reach out to me there for feedback, for guest recommendations, for sponsorship requests, and more. You can also follow me on all social media platforms at Lulu Hazen. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to or watch the show to get the latest episodes. And as usual, don't forget to share to your friends, family, colleagues, and whoever can benefit from this content. There is a link to a survey, to a podcast listener survey in the show's description. I would urge you to please spend seven minutes of your time to fill up the survey. It would really help me in getting to know you, our audience, a little bit more. And it would help me develop content that is value adding. Thank you so much and see you in a few weeks.